August 15, 1945. The established objective for Tiger Tai sorties was to pummel the US fleet, especially targeting big prizes like carriers if at all possible. We were usually not encouraged to dive into convoy ships, even if they were sitting ducks in the ocean below. This time, however, we were ordered on a one-way sortie to do as much damage as possible to anything that took our fancy. All of us had bombs strapped to our bellies, and there were no escorts. Our order was simple. Die. Every single remaining zero in Taiwan gathered in Yilan, and some transferred from there to Ishigaki-jima in preparation for a massive concerted attack scheduled for August 13th. I was ready to die and had no doubts in my mind that this would be the end. The sortie on August 13th was postponed because of the weather. The next day we received new orders to sortie on August 15th and were briefed of the formations in which we would fly. To our surprise, the leader of our squadron, a graduate of the Naval Academy, was to lead us in the first zero. Even though he had never been rostered before, it was all very bizarre. Attacks by US bombers had ceased, and something was very amiss. Some airmen complained there was no way decent targets can be located without intelligence on the enemy's whereabouts. Do they really expect us to dive into convoy ships? They're taking the piss. We were all prepared to die if ordered to do so. But now I was supposed to compromise the value of my final moments on this earth by scraping the bottom of the barrel. If that was the way it was going to be, then I'd just have to smash into the biggest convoy ship I could find. August 15th came. It was scorching weather shortly before noon. The green body of my Zero was so hot to the touch that it burned my finger. One pilot boarded his Zero wearing a light shirt intending to put on his flight uniform after reaching altitude. Others didn't even bother wearing their flight caps. Although the order was for all available Zeros to make this last ditched one-way sortie, there was only a paltry 30 machines altogether. When the Tiger Tai was first formed, there were about 150 Zeros, but many were destroyed in air raids. I boarded my Zero with a feeling of frustration and futility, as I am sure the others did, like carp on a cutting board. A flimsy tent was erected beside the runway as a command post. Officers and maintenance crew lined up next to the tent to bid us farewell, although I don't remember seeing any high-ranking officers. The grassy runway was parallel to the coastline and was only 1,000 metres long. The width of the runway was about 70 to 80 metres. The surface was cratered from bombing raids. Maintenance did their best to smooth the surface, but it was going to be exceedingly difficult to get airborne with 500 kilogram bombs. We were to take off to the south with the beautiful Pacific Ocean glistening to our left. About 30 zeros were going to depart in teams of four. I was in the front line piloting the third zero of the first section. I took my position to the left rear of the leader. The raucous whirring of engines pounded our ears and blew dust into the air. The leader signalled departure by opening his hands to each side, to which the ground crews removed the stoppers wedged under the tyres. The first zero started to crawl forward, taking this as my cue. I released the throttle and my zero lurched into motion. At that very moment, I noticed a vehicle hurtling toward us. A soldier in the car seemed to be shouting, not that he could be heard over the howling engines. He made a big cross with his arms, perplexed at the sudden intrusion. I stopped my zero just behind the leader's abort attack. The vehicle slid to a halt in front of the principal zero to block its path. A mechanic jumped onto my wing and told me that the mission had been cancelled. We were ordered back to the command post, so we jumped in the truck. We had no idea what was happening, but were notified in the commotion that an important radio broadcast was due to start any minute. The reception was poor, and it was barely audible, but there was no mistaking the blue-blooded voice of the emperor emanating from the crackling speakers. Japan had accepted total surrender, I heard somebody murmur. Ah, it's over. We were dumbstruck at first, and then, as if to confirm that we had heard the announcement correctly, a skid each other if the war was really over. Does that mean that we don't need to fly Zeros again? I initially thought that the war had ended, 
rather than Japan had been defeated. It also hit me that my life had, for some reason, been spared. I would live to see another day after all. Before long, however, various doubts began to cloud my mind. What the hell would happen to Japan? What's going to happen to me? I can't get back in my zero, so I suppose I'd better get out of my uniform. But, then what? Can I go home? I was confused. Adding to my agitation was the fact that we were stopped as we were coasting down the runway. Had the vehicle come even a minute later, I would not be alive to relay this story. It was in October 1944 when I volunteered as kamikaze pilot. Ten or so months had passed, and I had already turned eighteen. It felt as though I had awoken from a bad dream. When the dust settled, we were instructed to return to our fleet and flew from Yilan to Taichung. This time, instead of preparing to meet our deaths in a blaze of glory, it felt like we were taking a Lesurili sightseeing excursion. The Taigitai's last hurrah, a formal Taigitai report outlined what happened in the lead-up to this fateful moment. On August 13, an order was issued for a one-way kamikaze sortie to destroy enemy shipping around the main island of Okinawa. In accordance with this ultimatum, all Taigitai airmen were marshalled and put on standby, some in Ishigakijima and the rest at Yilan Air Base. The sortie was suspended, however, as scout planes were unable to locate the enemy and because the weather was deteriorating. Although Commander Tamai ordered sorties until this time to obtain more leverage for negotiating conditions of surrender, he was doubtful if kamikaze missions would have any impact after Japan assented to the Potsdam Declaration. Tamai was pressured by his superiors to deploy the Taigatai on August 15th. Just before the mission commenced, the Emperor's announcement of surrender was broadcast and the order was revoked. It has been noted that in the final days of the war, Japan's leaders adopted a strategy referred to as one more attack, then negotiation. This was to elevate Japan to a better position to parley terms with the Alliés by showing that they still had much to lose. It. The fundamental flaw with this strategy was that Japan had not the means to make any substantial offensive operations. The adoption of this tactic was subsequently criticised as delaying the peace process and causing unwarranted suffering and hardship. Ordering kamikaze suicide missions was an act of absolute futility, but those responsible for persevering with this approach have never been brought to task. As for the Tiger Tai, from the first suicide mission on April 1st through to the last successful one, 23rd mission on June 22nd, a total of 245 zero sorted resulting in the deaths of 46 pilots. Of the casualties, 76% were Yokeren graduates, the rest were student draftees. Furthermore, 88% of the suicide bombers were airmen of low rank. In terms of the damage caused to Allied shipping, three vessels were destroyed one small carrier, two convoy ships, ten sustained heavy damage, four large carriers, four middle-sized carriers, one small carrier and one destroyer, and over ten aircraft were shot down. The order of nightmares. Even now, I still have bad dreams about that final order to sortie. I cannot reconcile what it was all for. Why were we, a squadron specially organised to attack US carriers, told to attack convoy ships anchored off the Sea of Okinawa. Nobody has been able to answer this. I suspect that Tamai knew Japan was going to accept the Potsdam Declaration before August 14th. Yet, he still ordered all his airmen to use the remaining operational planes in a last-ditched assault on convoy ships. I believe that Tamai and the other brass cared little about our lives. Why could the terms of surrender not be concluded with kamikaze pilots still alive? Was it their intention to inform the Americans that all kamikaze suicide bombers had perished? My gut tells me that this was the motivation for sending us to our deaths. Otherwise, I cannot comprehend why we were dispatched to destroy such trivial targets. I don't know who decided to send us to our graves without escorts. I want to believe that our superiors were in the fight with us, if not in body, then at least in spirit, and would not sacrifice us lightly if there was any other way. We talked amongst ourselves, conjecturing that this heartless mandate must have come from the Combined Fleet Headquarter in Tokyo, 
rather than those directly above us. My fury over this unconscionable directive has never abated. Saved by radio waves, there was a huge difference in radio technology between Japan and the Allies. Often we would fly into an area where sightings of enemy shipping were reported, only to find there was nothing there. If they had been there, by the time we reached the area, they had already moved out of range. On other occasions we encountered enemy fighters, even though scout planes reported that the skies were clear. I figured that the Americans were keeping tabs on our movements by radar or with their submarines as we were taking off. They always seemed to be a step ahead. Our air bases also had radar equipment. I had seen them in use once, but the scrawling white lines on the monitor were impossible to make head or tail of. The operator told me that Japanese radars were practically useless. I sensed that Japan was lagging way behind the Allies, not only in naval and air superiority, but also with its radio technology. Ironically, this may have been a factor that allowed me to survive the war. Saitama's distinguished trio of birds. There were three cadets in the Yokoren B class referred to by everyone as the three birds of Saitama. The three were Kinzo Kasuya, Hiroshi Toyoda and me. Kasuya was the eldest son of prominent farming family. Toyoda was the second son of fishmonger. Both had excellent grades at school and Toyoda was head boy of his class. The three of us took the Yokaran entrance examination together and became close friends prepared to die together as Cherry Blossom brothers. Both Kasuya and Toyoda were killed in the war. I was the only one left of the trio. Toyoda was posted from Iwakuni to Borneo, where he undertook combat training. Fuel supplies were dwindling at the time, so some Yokaren graduates were sent overseas where there were enough fuel reserves to train. In the middle of October 1944, shortly after my arrival in Clark Field, I heard Zeros coming in to land one evening. I went out to see who it was. A few airmen alighted their planes, and among them was Toyoda. Hey there, Toyoda. Hi, Kazu. It was a happy reunion, as we had not seen each other since Iwakuni. Happy though it was, the get-together was short-lived, I visited his barracks the following morning to catch up, but he had already gone. I never heard anything from or about him after this chance meeting, but assumed that he was alive and well somewhere. It was not until a few years after the war when I learned of Toyoda's death. It seems that he had flown to Manila that morning. From there he sorted as a kamikaze suicide bomber, but the base was destroyed in an American raid shortly after his departure, so there were no details of what happened to him. I assume he was triumphant. His two-rank posthumous promotion suggests this was the case. Those killed in action were usually promoted one rank. Those who died with distinction, such as kamikaze pilots, were promoted two ranks. Kasuya sorted from a base in Kyushu in a Shidenkai and smashed his aircraft into a B-29 in May 1945, I heard afterwards that he intercepted a formation of B-29s heading home after a bombing run. Kasuya dove into a B-29 above Takeda City in Oita Prefecture. The B-29 crashed, but the crewmen bailed out with parachutes. Kasuya somehow managed to exit his plane, but his parachute failed to open, and he fell to his death on property owned by the Kuboyama family. A daughter of the family saw him falling from the sky and ran out to help but he was dead on impact. I believe he was awarded two ranks posthumously. In 1980, Mr. Kuboyama erected a stone monument for him. A memorial ceremony was held in which former American soldiers also attended. Unfortunately, I was unable to go. Monument inscription, late in the spring of 1945, in the last stages of war, as the battles in Okinawa raged, Major cities in the mainland were constantly being blitzed by American bombers. The war situation had become desperate, and the Japanese were preparing for the impending invasion and death in the defence of the motherland. On the morning on May 5th, a fine day, a formation of B-29s, which had completed a bombing run on cities in northern Kyushu, appeared in the sky overhead. A Japanese fighter plane from Omura Air Base in Nagasaki intercepted and dove into a B-29 at full speed. It was a brave and bold move. The silver wings of the B-29 folded as it erupted in fire and crashed into this hill, 
the Japanese fighter also crashed in a deep valley. The aircraft was a Shidenkai, one of the finest in the Imperial Japanese Navy. The pilot was a young man of 19 named Kasuya. His remains are enshrined in the village hall. He hailed from Migashima village, present-day Tokorozawa city, Iruma county, in Saitama prefecture. His soul rests to this day in the valley. Thirty years passed when we decided to erect this monument in memory of his sacrifice to our nation's future. His precious life is a rock in its foundation. March 1980, an earlier monument was erected near the resting place of the B-29. The inscription reads as follows. In May 1945, Japan looked close to losing the war, and her people were undergoing severe hardship. The mainland was bombed incessantly by B-29s, and the battles taking place in Okinawa looked to be utterly hopeless for the Japanese. One hundred million Japanese people prepared to defend the country with their lives. A little after 8am on May 5, 1945, a Japanese fighter plane chased a formation of B-29s returning from an attack on Tachiarai Air Base in the outskirts of Kurume City. It battled ferociously in the skies above Nauiri County in Oita Prefecture, this area, and crash dived into a B-29. The B-29 exploded in a ball of fire and plummeted to the ground. The Japanese fighter fell from the sky and the airman, a young Navy pilot, was found dead with a letter to his mother in his chest pocket. Twelve American crewmen bailed out of the bomber and landed safely with their parachutes. They were subjected to violent abuse by enraged villagers, and some of the airmen were killed. Eight more died in human experiments conducted at the Imperial University of Kyushu. We think back on this tragedy of 33 years ago, and the dreadful fates of these men still weigh heavily on our haunted consciences. Here we erect this monument and remember them in a ceremony that transcends emotions of affinity and enmity. We pray for the souls of all the deceased and dedicate this monument to their memory in the deep-felt hope that such a tragedy never be repeated. May 5th, 1977. Kasuya and Toyoda were both cheerful, nice lads. Seven or eight of us visited Toyoda's house and grave after the war. I heard Kasuya's older sister took over the family household following his death, but I felt hesitant to visit out of a sense of guilt. We did not think Japan would lose the war when we entered the Yokoren. As the situation deteriorated and the fighting became desperate, we all managed the adversity with grace and dignity. The war brought the best out in us, but it was truly heartbreaking for we who happened to survive. We vowed to perish together with our brothers. Shortly after the war, I arranged an annual memorial ceremony for the 205th Air Group veterans. Each year for 30 years we met and stayed at a hotel near the Yasukuni Shrine where we drank and talked until dawn. It was through these reunions that I learned what happened to my two wonderful friends, Toyoda and Kasuya. I also sorted many times with Katsumi Kagawa. He was with me in the 5th Taigatai mission when we signalled to each other to forego crash diving into the submarine. We boarded the same train from Kagoshima to return home following repatriation after the war. He lived in Hiroshima, so would stay at my house after our yearly reunions before making the long trip back by train. I had an opportunity to go to Hiroshima on Metropolitan Police business in 1971. I suggested that we meet up. He was married and driving taxis then. We stayed up till late and talked for hours, but hardly ever mentioned the war. We mostly chatted about news of mutual friends, some things that were just too painful to revisit, and we still embraced a simmering rage about what went on at the end of it all. Those who attended the 205th Air Group reunions were mainly Yokaran graduates and some student draftees. Chikanari Monji, author of Sora to Umi no Hatede, Beyond the Ends of the Sky and Sea, was a student draftee and secretary to Vice Admiral Onishi, Commander-in-Chief of Number no. 1 Fleet. He attended without fail every year of our superior officers from those dark days. Vice Admiral Onishi committed suicide by seppuku to take responsibility. I think that he was indeed responsible. It was he who ordered us to sacrifice our lives. I heard that he said to those close to him, 
I too am no longer alive. He killed himself the day after surrender. As for Tamai, commander of the 205th Air Group, instead of killing himself to atone, he took up the tonsure and became a Buddhist priest. He dedicated the rest of his life to placating the souls of his dead men. I think their decisions show a stark difference in life philosophy and conscience. Some of our superiors sent young men to their deaths, saying, You go first, I will follow. Many of them did not follow through. I wonder how most of them lived with themselves after the war. Kamikaze casualties, kamikaze suicide attacks met with some degree of success around the beginning in October 1944. Both the Navy and Army utilised this tactic continually at the front in the Philippines. At the battles in Okinawa, many suicide planes took off from bases in Kyushu and Taiwan to target Allied troop ships. Not limited to zeros, almost all Navy and Army aircraft were used for kamikaze attacks. In the final stages of hostilities, even canvas-covered training planes were commandeered. Most, however, were shot down by intercepting fighters before reaching enemy ships. Those which managed to evade interceptors were often shot down by high-performance anti-aircraft machine guns on the ships. Nevertheless, it has been estimated that around 11%, another source claims 16%, of kamikaze airmen successfully reached their intended targets. It is true that the kamikaze caused more damage than conventional attacks. Approximately 3,600 Army and Navy aircraft were used in kamikaze attacks in the 10 months from October 1944 to August 1945. There is varying data concerning the number of kamikaze casualties. One official document recognises the names of all those who perished in kamikaze attacks, 2,517 Navy and 1,440 Army personnel making 3,957 in total. As for the damage caused by kamikaze missions, 34 ships were sunk with around 300 sustaining damage. Among those sunk, three were escorting carriers, 13 were destroyers, and 18 other types of vessels. The 300 that were damaged included 16 regular carriers, 20 escorting carriers, 15 battleships, 15 cruisers, and 101 destroyers. The Navy already started developing various weapons for suicide missions before the commencement of zero kamikaze attacks. Among them, Oka was a kind of single-man rocket carried to its target by a Type 1 ground attacker. The Uka was released when approaching the target and hurtled into the enemy ship. The Kaiten was a small one-man submarine with a warhead located at the front. It was transported by a destroyer and fired at the enemy which is why it was called human torpedo. The Shinyo was a small motorboat loaded with explosives that was driven into enemy shipping. All of these weapons were deployed in battle, and more were in the process of being developed when the war came to an end. According to American sources, suicide missions did succeed in delaying the US advance in the Philippines and Okinawa. Prominent Japanese novelist Shohei Ohoka, who himself was drafted into the army and served in the Philippines, published a famous book titled War Chronicle of Leyte. In it, he writes the following. Although it was touted that Japanese victory was imminent, by this stage of the war none of the commissioned officers believed it. They were strung along by the illusion that even one more victory would benefit Japan's position in the peace negotiations. They acted to save face and concealed their true objective with the guise of strategy. More abhorrent was sending young men to needless deaths in kamikaze suicide operations, all in the name of eternal justice. Nevertheless, of the more than 400 who sorted from the Philippines and more than 1,900 in Okinawa, 111 missions were successful in the former and 133 in the latter. Almost the same number met with partial success. The suicide pilots were men of whom Japan should be proud, enduring mental anguish and distress that falls beyond our powers of imagination. They were able to see their missions through to their fatal conclusion. Their feats should not be equated with the insanity and corruption of Japan's war leaders. The strength of will these young men embodied seems to be lacking in the youth of today, 
as it could only have emanated from the desolation of war. Such a demonstration of willpower should offer Japanese a sense of hope. By the day Japan surrendered, about 2.3 million soldiers from the Imperial Japanese Navy and Army were killed in action or had died of disease and starvation. In addition, approximately 800,000 citizens perished in the merciless bombing of Japanese cities. In total, it is estimated that 3.1 million Japanese died in the war. Return to Japan from zeros to nothing. We heard all manner of news after returning to Taichung following the cancellation of the last sortie. There wasn't much of a mood for resistance, even though we knew of some diehards who stubbornly opposed surrender. We heard that Chinese troops under Chiang Kai-shek were coming to occupy Taichung. The remaining zeros were to be handed over to the Chinese army. Their soldiers wore what looked like labourers' clothes with bamboo hats. They carried long poles on their shoulders, from which wicker baskets were slung to transport personal effects. We were quite taken aback by their casual appearance. The commander in charge of Japanese disarmament was a lieutenant general in the Chinese army, a graduate of Japan's Army War College. We repaired the damaged planes and surrendered them as ordered. Upon taking possession of the remaining Japanese aircraft, they asked us ever so politely how to fly the machines. We taught them basic techniques for taking off and landing. The Chinese soldiers were strangely courteous, even referring to us as honourable teachers. The allure of Taiwan, after surrendering all the zeros, we were directed to a village in the east of Taichung. It was located at about 500 metres above sea level, and close to the entrance of a mountain range that extended the length of Taiwan. The village itself was about two kilometres long from east to west, and several hundred metres wide. There were rice fields aplenty making for lush green scenery. The village mayor built three straw-thatched houses for us. Each was about three to four metres wide and twelve to fourteen metres in length. We settled into the huts and began farming chores under the villagers' guidance. They were very kind and came every day to teach us how to use and repair the tools. It was a completely different world to what we had experienced in the Kamikaze Corps. As the days went by, the dreaded feeling of imminent death started to dissipate. We worked the fields in bare feet and it almost felt as if we had been transported back to our childhood days. Our main tasks involved cropping sugarcane and cultivating vegetables. It was the middle of September and stiflingly hot. We were always caked in mud and sweat, and our faces were tanned dark brown. By November, the vegetables were ready for harvest. Even though Taiwan was much smaller than Japan, the climate was always warm, which meant crops would reach maturity faster and could be reaped a few times each year. Not as much land was needed to sustain the population compared to Japan. It has very high mountains where even apples could be grown. Every kind of fruit found in Japan could be cultivated there. Taiwan truly was a wonderful place to live. In the evenings, villagers came by our huts to chat with us. The adults and children all spoke Japanese to varying degrees. On rainy days, a former student draftee who specialised in Chinese at college in Japan taught us the rudiments of the language. Our interaction with the villagers was going so well, we began to think about a future there. We discussed amongst ourselves our fears of being arrested or even executed by the Americans if we returned to Japan. We were anxious about what the future had in store for us. The village mayor suggested that we stay put, he even offered us land and promised to find us wives. He was rather plump man and could speak a little Japanese. We can harvest rice twice and vegetables four times a year. You don't even need to work here. Life's easy. If you go back to Japan, you'll not be treated well, so stay with us. He was unbridled in his enthusiasm to keep us in the village. I guess he thought that if we married local girls it would bring vitality to the village and change the mood there. We had no inkling of what was happening back in Japan and discussed his offer almost every night. In the end, 15 or 16 of our group decided to accept. I was one of them and was quite happy to spend the rest of my days there. In the middle of December, however, American troops came to the village with an ultimatum to repatriate to Japan. The mayor was quite disappointed and we felt bad for him. 
The return to Kagoshima by boat in late December 1945, we were moved to Keelung Port to board a Japan-bound ship. We bid the good villagers farewell, having cherished the pleasant experience living among them. Preparation for return was a hasty affair, and before we knew it, we were waiting at the quay in Keelung among rows of warehouses. There were forty of us gathered there. Most were zero pilots with a few maintenance crewmen. For some reason I remember melted sugar falling into sea from one of the warehouses. We were subjected to body searches and handguns and other items deemed unsuitable were confiscated. I managed to hide the short sword awarded to me by the commander-in-chief of the combined fleet. We boarded a US Navy coastal defence ship and informed we were bound for Kagoshima. We were told in advance that we'd be boarding a Japanese ship, so this sudden change made us nervous. I was afraid that we'd be taken to America instead of Japan, and someone even suggested that we'd be executed and our bodies chucked into the Pacific. Most of us were having second thoughts about boarding, but reluctantly we did. It soon became dark and the sea was rough. The further out to sea we went, the blusterier it became. The vessel itself was not big at around thousand tons, so it rolled violently in the storm. Some of the waves were twice the height of the ship, and they smashed us sideways into the ocean. We all got horribly seasick and vomited non-stop. We weren't keen to have anything to do with the American crewmen. It was the first time we ever had direct contact with our former enemies. We hated them. They kept their distance from us as well, probably thinking that we were unstable maniacs. The whole idea of kamikaze suicide attacks was such an absurd concept to them. They must have reckoned us to be a bunch of insane freaks who despised life. The ocean became beautifully calm after the second or third day. When I was looking out to sea from the deck, I could make out the shape of a cone-shaped mountain on the horizon. It had to be Mount Kaimon. I saw it almost every day when I was a Yokoran cadet at Kasanohara Air Base in Kagoshima. The others also saw it and all let out hoots of delight. Japan. It's really Japan. The city of Kagoshima had been burnt to the ground in relentless air raids. We assembled in a classroom of some elementary school left barely intact. An American officer told us that we were to return to our hometowns immediately and find jobs. If you turn into drifters and don't find work, he admonished, you'll be locked up. I knew nothing about America's new role in Japan as I had no access to newspapers or the radio, but I thought he was over the top considering the war had ended. They made us write down our final destinations. A Japanese official gave me a train ticket and told me to disembark at Tokyo Station. Some of the Japanese officials sported civvies and others wore their old military uniforms. Everything went smoothly in the end, and despite my annoyance with the American officer, I understood that we were being treated with special consideration. We stayed a night in Kagoshima and then boarded the train for Tokyo at 7am the next morning. Kagawa-san, with whom I had sortied many times, got off at Hiroshima. We were aware that Hiroshima had been obliterated by an atomic bomb. I stuck my head out the window and looked at the charred ruins of the city. We had already passed through burned cities and towns after departing Kagoshima, but Hiroshima was something else. In the other towns I saw half-burned buildings and a few houses still standing. But Hiroshima was flat for as far as the eye could see. It was the most dreadful sight, I asked Kagawa-san if he had any place to go to. He replied, I don't know, I'll have to go and see what I can find, I was worried about him. All I could say was, well, be seeing you some day. Hiroshima impressed upon me that the war really was over. Leaving Hiroshima behind us, we started talking about how we were supposed to pick up from here. Somebody mentioned that we'd have to make our own way from now. We were all still young and had always been part of a close-knit group, but now we were going to be alone for the first time in our lives, a strangely worrying prospect. My priority was to get home and find a job lest I be interned by the Americans for being a drifter. Everybody felt the same, but the chances of finding gainful employment in the confines of our hometowns was surely going to be slim. Born the second son, taking over the family farm was out of the question for me. I just couldn't see what I could possibly do. Kazuo Tsunoda was on the same train to Tokyo. 
He was eight years my senior and an excellent pilot. He married when the war ended but was forbidden from taking employment in public office due to the general headquarters purge. He fell on hard times for quite a while after the war, as many of us did. New Year's Eve. Homecoming, the train arrived at Tokyo Station at 7 or 8 on New Year's Eve, 1945. I transferred lines and got off at Nishi Tokorozawa Station, the very place I received my grand send-off to the Yokoren two years and eight months before. I dropped in to see a close friend who lived near the station. He and his family were sitting around a kotatsu chit-chatting when I entered. Hey, he looked at me in utter disbelief. You're alive. They served me a cup of tea, but I excused myself because my clothes were teeming with lice. I didn't want to infest the tatami. They warned me that an occupation soldier might arrest me given my appearance and lent me a bicycle to get home. They were referring to my flying uniform. I jumped on the bike and pedalled as fast as I could down the dark roads with no lamp to light the way. I saw car headlights coming from the opposite direction so immediately leapt off my bike and hid. An American jeep passed by without noticing me. I was lucky. It might have been troublesome had they seen me. It was a little after 10pm when I arrived home. Hi, I'm back, I announced in a loud voice. Relatives happened to be visiting. They were stunned and rushed to me. It's Kazusan. I stopped short of entering the room because of my foul-smelling, louse-ridden clothes. My mother couldn't stop staring at me. She was lost for words, and then tears began to fall from her eyes. The last contact I had with my family was ten months ago, I sent a postcard home when I returned to Japan to pick up the new zeros. My family had no idea what fate had befallen me after that, or whether I was even alive. I turned 19 that month. Two years and eight months have passed since I left to enter the Yokoran. It all seemed surreal. Mother asked me why I wouldn't come inside. I am covered in lice and haven't bathed for ages. Although it was very cold, I stripped naked in the garden and then went inside to take a bath. Soaking in the tub, I talked for a long time with Mother, who was busy stacking firewood next to the stove. I don't remember what we talked about, but I avoided the subject of the war entirely. Mother boiled my clothes the next day to kill the lysa. I sat near the warm, sunken hearth after my bath. I finally felt at home. I took out the short sword I received from the fleet commander, and threw it on the fire, thinking, I don't need you any more. Two days later, a local policeman visited to our house. You've brought back something dangerous from the war, have you not? Oh yes, here it is, I replied and handed him a burned clump of steel. The post-war blues, I slept for most of New Year's Day. In the afternoon, I could hear voices coming from outside. People heard that I had returned and were coming to see for themselves. A relative who lived next door, a former professor at Tenry University, came and said in genuine disbelief, Kazusan, you really came back. As I lay in my futon, I figured that the best plan of action was to wait until things had settled down before looking for a job. Although we were told by the Americans to find work forthwith, Japanese society was in such a discombobulated state that it was not really an option. Before long, my old classmates dropped in to see me as well. I asked them what they were doing. Most had been employed in some capacity in the arms industry, but the companies had closed shop and they were left jobless. I had no idea what I wanted to do. For a start, I was oblivious to how much Japan had changed while I was away fighting. At least I had some savings to fall back on as there was nowhere to spend my pay at the front. Money was not an issue for the time being, so I squandered my days doing pretty much nothing at all. Most of my friends were unemployed, barely managing to eke out a living by selling household items, helping neighbours with chores and the like. Some of them were making money under the table by acquiring and selling goods on the black market. They would deal in pilfered factory or military equipment, and some stolen crops to sell. These were destitute times, and Japan was verging on the state of collapse. I began to resent this state of affairs. I was prepared to forego my life for the good of the country and was disenchanted to see how truly crestfallen Japan was. The more I thought about the sacrifices kamikaze pilots had made, 
the more incensed I became. My brothers died to protect their families and the nation, but their gallant martyrdom had been forgotten as people busied themselves trying to get their hands on a bit of food here and some extra cash there. Defeat and utter despair. I was no exception, frittering my days away. I started to think that subsisting like a bum was okay, as long as I didn't bother others. It was hard to be upbeat, but deep down I knew that this attitude was wrong. I needed to get back on my feet and appease the souls of my dead brothers. They didn't make the ultimate sacrifice so that Japan could turn to shit. I certainly didn't go around advertising this belief, but knew that I had to find a way to inject some positivity in people around me. Anything would do. To this end, I decided to revive the Kagura performance at the local shrine, cheering up the community, the Katano Tenjin. Shrine in our village had a spacious yard. It was where my purification ceremony was conducted before heading to the Yokoren. At the annual festival held on March 21st, it was once customary to erect a stage in the yard for Kagura performances or for small circus groups to entertain the villagers. These festivities had long been suspended due to the war. I reckoned the village youth could get involved and coordinate the first Kagura event in years. Most villages in Japan had young men's associations, and I was sure it would cheer everybody up if we went ahead with the project. I consulted one of my friends, Arahata, who had been a junior pilot in the army. He willingly agreed to help, and we set the wheels in motion. First, we had to persuade the president of the Young Men's Association. He was about three years older than me. We went to his house late January in 1946. I asked him for some ideas to bring some joy to the community. He admitted that he had none, so I told him of our plan. He was not particularly keen, however, citing how everybody was too busy trying to get food to survive, and it was not the right time to call on the other members. Even if I put the word out, I doubt if many will come. The anger welling up inside me was too much to bear. I exploded when I heard this cop-out, President. Do you have any idea what the hell you are saying? As young soldiers, we didn't fight tooth and nail to defend such a sad bunch of sour pussies. It's the time for the Young Men's Association to get off its arse and stand up now. Hearing my impassioned plea, his mother and other family members seemed a little uneasy as they peered through the sliding door. The president quickly changed his tune and apologised. I suggested he didn't need to shoulder the burden. We'll take the stand for you. We already devoted our lives to a bigger cause once. He consented, and we put our plan into action as a young men's association undertaking. Next, we had to convince the shrine's priest. He was also a history teacher at the elementary school I once attended. We survived the war, as you can see, and we have an idea to help the community. We'd like to bring the Kagura performance back for the upcoming festival. Who's going to do it? he asked. We want to do it as a project of the Young Men's Association. We'll need to learn the moves and the instruments, though. He was very receptive. Excellent idea, boys. Please, be my guest. We needed a place to practice. My relative, the former professor of Tenry University, had a large room on the second floor of a warehouse. He was happy to let us use it. Apart from the dance itself, we also had to study the traditional music called ohayashi that accompanied Kagura performances. There was an old couple revered as masters of Kagura, living in a small hamlet about a kilometre away. We knew how they lamented the demise of Kagura, and the fact that there was no young blood to continue the tradition after they were gone. Arahata and I paid them a visit. They were in their seventies and were delighted with our undertaking. With all the necessary patrons now on board, we composed a written appeal to members of the Young Men's Association. A little over twenty fellows from the village agreed to join us, and practice began in earnest. Coming by foot along the dark road every night after work, the old couple taught us ohayashi and dancing. At first, it was difficult deciding who would perform the oyama role in which a man plays a woman. You do the oyama, are you kidding? In the end, we brought it all together and performed with singleness of mind. A good crowd gathered on March 21st, despite the depressed mood that permeated the village following years of hardship. Even those who had married and moved to other parts of the country came back for the festival. 
The old couple was pleased, and the priest showered us with praise. It was a raging success. Recruited by the Metropolitan Police, a man from the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department came to the village one or two weeks after the festival. His purpose was to recruit me. Public order in Tokyo had deteriorated considerably with many rampaging foreigners, Koreans, attacking public offices or robbing supplies. Thin newspapers were obtainable back then, but much of the content covered the latest news about foreigners causing havoc in places like Shinbashi and Shibuya in central Tokyo. During the war, Koreans were badly treated, and this escalation of violence was a reaction to years of oppression. I was told by my would-be recruiter that the police were currently powerless to control the chaos. He informed me of the drive to bolster police numbers, and he wanted me to consider joining. The police desperately needed recruits to bring some order to Tokyo. He explained what police work entailed including the rotation work system in which policemen were given time to practice kendo or judo in their off-duty hours. He added that every police station was equipped with a kendo dojo. Only in the army or the police could kendo be practiced during work hours. Of course, the army was not an option anymore, but the thought of continuing kendo in the police was greatly appealing to me. If I can practice kendo in the police, then sign me up. I was still 19 but the entry age requirement turning was 20. I would turn 20 in December, so took the exam in November and joined the Metropolitan Police Academy in February 1947. Police departments were prefectural bodies, as I lived in Saitama, not Tokyo. It seemed odd that a Tokyo Metropolitan Police recruiter would come out to see me. I assumed that the occupation forces kept tabs on where the former kamikaze pilots were, and furnished the police with that information. Otherwise, how would they have any idea where I lived, from the occupation force's perspective? Fanatical kamikaze pilots were still more of a threat than the burgeoning extreme left, and must have thought we were better engaged in maintaining public order than left to our own devices and going where the wind blew us.